welcome back to another episode. I am your host, Samantha McCoy, and today we are welcoming to the show Aaron Michael Tucker. And he is a special guest because he came highly recommended by another, a previous guest of ours, Samson Benutu. And so Aaron, I am so glad to have you on the show today. And we're gonna introduce him so you all will know exactly what he does. Aaron is a freelance cinematographer and filmmaker who is passionate about simple human stories told with bold perspective. He strives to create images that feel lived in, humanized, and convey a sense of art, soul, and journey. Aaron is a recent graduate of American University's graduate film program and currently works as director of photography right here in the DMV. And for you out of towners, that is DC, Maryland, and Virginia. So Aaron, I am so glad that Samson recommended you. I'm excited about our conversation today. Welcome. Thank you, Sam. I'm super happy to be here. Um, this is like surreal to just be able to talk about just like life and, and work and, um, you know, be amongst like like-minded people who are doing similar things as well. So thanks for having me. Yes, no problem. So let's jump right in, Aaron. So how did you get started in, uh, in cinematography and film? I, I understand that you actually went through a series of jobs and careers and just trying to think of what you, what would actually be your home or your sweet spot. So tell us a, about that a little bit. Yeah, so um, my journey, I feel like a, like a lot of other people has been just like a series of winding roads. Um, like starting out, I kind of just like, I always, when I think back, I always remember I would always in my free time just find myself watching TV, watching movies. Um, I remember watching like Chucky when I was like four or five and just being like terrified to like dangle my feet off the bed because like, I felt like he would like cut my Achilles or something like oh, wow. some, yeah, just some type of like some type of way he got somebody in in the movies. Um, and like at the time, you know, I'm young and I don't really like understand like what's going on. But like looking back, I'm just like, oh, like I, you know, in that moment, my disbelief was like suspended. Like I thought this this monster like was real. Um, and then, you know, that, you know, sort of that viewing experience, that passive viewing experience kind of like carried on for, you know, the next several years as I'm, you know, you know, preteen, starting to watch stuff like, like New York undercover after school. <laughs> um, and just being like, you know, engaged with like the characters lives and like what they're doing. Um, you know, when they're on the job, what they do when they come back to their families. Um, you know, you, you watch the show and next, thing you know, like a whole hour has passed. Um, and again, it just, that pattern just continued to like repeat itself. Um, but I never really like, I didn't have like family who worked in the arts or like yeah. something, something to like, like a blueprint or something to like see that like, oh, there are like careers and mm -hmm. like, like production that, you know, I could also pursue. Um, so it, it was very passive. Um, and then in college, um, I really just, I, I was like book smart. So I'm not gonna say like I, I like wasted my time, but I felt like I thought more about how do I leave here with a job versus like what do I enjoy and how can I position myself to work in a space where I'm doing the things that I enjoy. Um, and not to say that like that's like a, a bad way to think. I think it, it just happened and it, it led me to um, kind of like my first like pseudo career. Um, uh, working as an IT consultant. Um, prior to, I'd done like a bunch of other things, like I was a, a cashier at a pool, you know, again, just like, you know, make money so, so you yeah. can live. Um, I worked at Best Buy for a little bit. Um, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't last long enough to get my blue polo. <laughs> I was always like, I was a white <laughs> polo trainee. Oh no. Um, yeah, man. I was, I was trying to double dip. I was working two jobs and I didn't show up one day and then they left a voicemail and said that my services are no longer needed. Oh, wow. Cut the road. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. Um, shoot. Uh, like I had a bunch of like government internships in college. Um, I like the interior and the, the comptroller of the currency. Um, you know, I did like 
uh, what are the things those jobs called in, in school? Like not financial work, work study or something. Yeah. yeah work, work study. study. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I had like a, a couple of jobs, um, at the university of Maryland. And again, like thinking back, it's just, I was just thinking about like, yo, how can I just make money? So I'm not broke. Right. I'm not really right. So what did, like, what did you study? It's a great question. So I studied, um, finance and information systems. Um, oh, I thought wow. I was going to, yeah, I thought I was going to be a banker um, <laughs> or something in, in that field. Trying to do um, something secure. <laughs> yeah, like I, I just didn't want to be broke. <laughs> All right, right. Um, so, yeah, like it was cool, man. But it wasn't something that like kept me up at night. I wasn't really, you know, I was, I, I'll make sure I like I did what I needed to do. So I was right. eligible for, you know, the type of careers that the school try to align people with. But it wasn't something that, you know, I'd be staying up late at night to like seek more information um, or like want to share with other people like hey this is like what I'm learning in my in my day to day right um, right and um so like all through like um undergrad um I'm mainly just focusing on you know you know studies you know make sure I land a job um and I remember like I had like one one friend um back from like high school who was like like big into like film and like film theory not so much even like making them but just like like stories and like like how they're like they're like simple or I guess they're just like like nuanced ways of like communication and they're like mm -hmm. this melting pot for like a bunch of mediums where um you know if you like music like it's got music if you like writing you know obviously it's got strong writing if you like um photography um fashion design like all all these different types of things um so um he was the one who like first put me onto a bunch of like kind of like shows that I remember like vividly in my like impressionable years um and then I also had another friend who um this guy named Jamal who would like shoot all the events at University of Maryland um and he was like big into like cameras at the time and I remember just looking at like yo this is so cool man like how you're just able to like connect with people, um, make them feel like happy, and then you, you, know, you get their pictures, and um, those pictures evoke like you know feelings of like joy, um, feelings of like whatever they were feeling at the at the given time, and it's like a memory for them. Um, but again, like I'm just like focused on like school work, and I kind of just told myself once I have, once I feel like I have some extra time, um, then I'll like you know invest in a camera and you know, see where things go from there. Um, so yeah, so once I started working, um, my first job, I was working at um, Deloitte um, in Arlington. No, I think it was Roslyn, Virginia was our mm -hmm, home office. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the day-to-day -day stuff, um, you know, served its purpose. I feel like I learned a lot of like soft skills that I still use today. I met a lot of great people, um, but I did um, end up getting my, my first camera, like kind of like immediately, like once I got the job and that was just like like a mind blowing experience to me, um, like from the standpoint of like like technology. Um, and obviously, like some people would think it's like it's simple, like photography is like it's a you know a, a still image. Um, but at the same time, there was like there was this like software called Magic Lantern mm -hmm. um, that you could install on Canon DSLRs, and that would um, essentially like make the cameras like a cinema camera and it will allow you to capture like so much more like data. Um, it would, it would give you access to like tools to like better, like measure, like basically tools to like measure, like, you know, your exposure, like your focus, all the tools that you would like have to pay like way more money um, oh, wow. to, to use in like higher end cameras. Um, and like, I don't know. I just kept going down this like rabbit hole of like like gaining more information about like photography, um, and imaging, and you know that just made me. And basically, I think from there, like I was just starting to like lose like sleep over like photography and and wow. thinking about like how it applied to like the movies and the, the television that I liked. Um, and I felt like. Um, like you know let me just like keep exploring this 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 thing that I'm feeling I feel like it I still didn't really like know like what to do with yeah. you know that 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 energy um so I started looking for opportunities at Deloitte to shoot like internal videos 
And um, at the time there weren't any, um, now there's like a whole bunch just cause oh, everything wow. is digital. Um, I ended up taking like a free internship at this gallery in DuPont Circle called um, Hillier Art Space. Um, and it was like unpaid. And I was like, I was still working at Deloitte while I did the internship. So I would work there Fridays and Saturdays. Um, and on Fridays, I would just like carry my laptop, my work laptop with me <laughs> to the gallery and have it like, like <laughs> under my desk as people are like coming in to, to see the exhibits. And I would just pray <laughs> that like nothing like urgent would happen. Wow. Um, <laughs> and then basically like I, I worked there because that was the first place that would like, that gave me like the freedom to like practice on the job. So I would shoot artist spotlights for the, um, the new artists who would be exhibiting their works um, every, I think like every month at the gallery. Um, and I, I don't know, I just really like, I felt like I'd never been like stimulated um, in that way yeah. that I had been like, just like figuring out how to like express myself through like, you know, simple storytelling through images, um, constantly like connecting with new people who um, I feel like, you know, they value like, you know, similar things and kind of like use their, whether it's their art or their work um, as like a form of like expression to, yeah. to get out how they feel as well. Um, and um, eventually I started like sharing some of the things that I did on like Instagram and, and connecting with people who like I already do who are like coincidentally doing the same things so like my my freshman year roommate at University of Maryland um his name's Joe Marshall um always on my roommate we lived across the hall from each other mm -hmm. but um essentially he was doing the same thing he was um um like producing and directing videos for his church um and then like once we like started sharing things we you know reconnected based off of that started working together again started growing and like maturing like you know our work um um and like yeah it's just like so many like those like little things kept happening and it just got to the point I was like all right cool so I'm I'm 25 or so I need to like um just be think critically about like how do I want to invest my time my energy my resources um in in, in you know the foreseeable future and I ended yeah. up um going to film school after that. Um, I went to American University to study, their, their degrees are like broad, it's just like um, film and media, um, but you can basically design your curriculum in a way that's um, best fitting for you. Oh, so nice. I mainly, yeah, yeah, so I mainly took um, like photography classes. Um, I took um, obviously cinematography as well, um, like, any class that had anything to do with like narrative um just because like my end goal really is to work on like feature length films and um like tv series that are more like drama um fiction fiction based um and i just made sure to just shoot like, as much as i could like i shot most of my classmates thesis films um i'm oh, wow. still yeah like i'm i feel like it was a great space for me to just like practice and build a new network I didn't know any like film people um at all like prior to joining um I feel like it, it may have happened even if I didn't go to school I don't think school is necessarily like you got to go but mm -hmm. um it, it was definitely beneficial for me um shooting yeah. one of my classmates thesis films this coming weekend um yeah and then like from there like I just started to work my way up um I started to meet working professionals who would like hire me as a camera PA. Nice. Um, so I would, you know, do whatever they needed, just yeah. be alert, be attentive, um, soak up as much game as I could. Um, eventually they would, you know, bump me up to, you know, be a camera assistant where, you know, instead of me just helping to like load in gear, you know, get lunch, um, I'd be helping to, you know, manage the camera rentals, the monitor, any, basically any sort of like technology um, under the scope of a, the camera department. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I make sure to rent it, um, to tech it, to build it, um, troubleshoot any issues with it on set. Um, and then from there, you know, you, you start, people will see, you know, that, you know, you actually like care about what you're doing and that you could probably like handle some more responsibility. So I started to operate 
um, it's just like operating the camera, um, thinking about different ways to um, like execute like the the vision of the photography. Right. Um, and I feel like all of, all of us like camera people are kind of the same. Like our goal is all to like direct photography. Um, yeah. Which is I feel like it, it should be. Um, well, actually, I want to I want to stop you because I want to kind of get some clarity. I'm talking a lot. On the, I'm talking on the, a lot. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's good. I just want to get some clarity on the roles. I, I'm really curious to know because we love to educate our listeners here about you know just different creative jobs. So, what is kind of the the progression from you know production assistant moving up? Like, do you typically have to start as a production assistant? Or what it, what is that that journey like? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it, it varies for for everyone. Um, some people st- out the gate start out at the top, you know, leading a camera department. Um, for a lot of other people, um, such as myself, it's more common to um, start out as a, um, a, a camera PA, um, which is just you know someone typically who goes from having like limited ex- limited knowledge to kind of just like a foundation of um, like what the camera department's role is on a, on a set. Um, and it kind of just for the, for the viewers, the director of photography leaves the department and they work alongside the director to essentially realize the vision of the film. Um, and then also kind of hire like the lighting people, the people who um, they call grips, people who help like shape the lights and position. and. Um, essentially just like texture them um and also um they hire like the camera assistants as well and those are the, the people who like uh, let me let me let me go back to the camera so cam you might start out as a camera you learn the experience um right above them are like second acs or second assistant cameras they're the people who you know whenever uh, a take starts or before the camera starts rolling they've got the slate and they they say what the shot is, clap the slate, step out of frame. Um, they're typically like helping actors um, with like setting marks on the ground, so like they know okay I start here when the shot starts and I finish over there. Um, they'll like load media in and out the camera or load film if it's a a project shot on film. Um, there's also a first assistant camera. Um, they're the ones who um, they're like the, the techies of the camera department, like the, typically the people who are supposed to know, like, you know, how the camera works, like how, what are the sweet spots where, where like the cameras or the lenses, any technology that we're using where it like suffers, so they can kind of like, you know, just help navigate that. Um, they pull focus for the camera. Um, so typically, um, um, basically the operator can just focus on framing shots, Mm -hmm. um, focus on movement, and then they'll be the ones who make sure that the shot is is sharp and it's not distracting for the viewer. Um, And they'll also manage like monitors. So like, you know, things will be shot and then there'll be like the director and all the other heads of department, anyone who needs to possibly like client, anyone who needs to like see the image um, and make sure that everything is happening according to plan so they typically just make sure just make sure the picture doesn't go away um that could be like a really <laughs> stressful job in and of itself depending on like what's going on um and then their operators they're the people who and you know, they got their hands on the camera or they got their hands on the gear that's being used to uh move the camera like it yeah. could be um like a, a gimbal it could be like a steady cam um or like those roller, the roller things that move from one yeah. side to the other. Yeah. What are yeah, those called? Do- I said roller dollies. things. <laughs> what, are they, what are they called? Roller. It's all the same. Roller things, dollies. Um, yeah. I, I, I think I think you're referring to dollies. <laughs> yes. Like with and the, they, with the you, wheels, they right? go roll back and forth. Like when you see it and it looks like the, the camera person is actually rolling through the through the scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Looks. Dollies, dollies. Yeah. yeah I love those. Um, so yeah, they, they got their hands on the camera and then the director of photography or cinematographer is um, kind of like interchangeable, but um, they essentially lead the department um, and work closest with the director to understand like, you know, what are, what are our goals for the project, um, for the narrative, and then like kind of 
help the director translate that into how we achieve those objectives um, photographically. Um, how do we like, you know, do it efficiently in a way where we can like make our days stay on on time and you know meet our budget. And then um, typically they're the ones who like um, not all the time, but usually like hire out the department. Got um, it. Like it's always nice to work with people that you have good relationships with that kind of have an understanding of you know how you like to light things, how you like to like frame things, you know, what type of pace you like to work at, um, what type of tools you like to use. Um, so yeah, they'll typically kind of like, you know, tap into the same pool of resources to, um, you know, build a unit, you know, so there's like division, divisions of labor, everyone's kind of got their, their marching orders. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's amazing. Thank you so much for that, for that education. Cause I've always wondered when I see movies and you're scrolling, you know, the credits are scrolling and they have all these people like the grid grips and the assistants and these people. And I'm just like, what in the world are all these people doing? <laughs> so, so that was very enlightening, very enlightening for me to know. So now, now I have a little bit more context to to everything so so i know aaron you have done just some amazing work of your own and i had a chance to look at your website and look at some of the projects that you've worked on um can you talk about is there one particular project that was you know you remember for a particular reason one that really stood out for you or even could you talk about maybe one of the roles that you've had is there one that you enjoy more or want to do more just Anything you want to share about that? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think I feel like I personally like like all the projects that I like show because I feel like they all like added, they all like did something special for me. But if I had to like, if I had to pick one, um, I would probably pick one that I did with a friend of mine, um, Adelina Perez or Alina Perez, um, called uh, oh, for. Uh, black women in opera yeah um and man like that was just like that one just it's just a project that like checks all the boxes for you for for me at least um and basically it was a like a promo for the the nonprofit, um just to um in general it was literally just like a, a promo um but i think it was special for me because um of the subject matter like yeah. you think of like opera you don't really think of like unless you like know the history you don't think of like like it's somewhere where like black women have had and continue to have like you know large presence um to set the tone for it um and to to be something that like you know younger you know black girls can like you know aspire to you know be a part of um so that was just more so like the subject matter that kind of like got me interested in it. Yeah. But as far as like the execution of it, um, I, I really like to, I always appreciate when I can, you know, photograph things um, in terms of like how they feel versus like how it like might actually be. Um, and Adi Alina, um, she's a, a director who, um, I think she has like very similar um, like sensibilities um, you know she's always looking for you know ways to convey feeling and expression um, and at the end of the day just like make people like watching what they're watching like you know have like some type of response to it and you know just be like wow like at the end of when you saw it and to be curious about like you know the in this case the organization behind it what they're doing um, and ideally like how you can get involved, you know, with, with the group. But that one was just amazing to me, just in terms of like all the resources put into it to, um, again, like convey that feeling. Like there were, there was amazing like wardrobe, um, like crazy, you know, makeup, you know, hair. Um, I think there were like, there was like a nail technician who like painted like portraits on like every nail for, oh, for wow. one of the women who was in it. Like the details um, really, um, it, it's just the details were like things that I like, I like wished I could shoot when I like started getting into cinematography. 
and were things that, um, you know, no matter like how, how technically sound you are, how much you know about like lighting and, and, and composition and, you know, and all the like gear and stuff, like it almost doesn't matter if you don't have something in front of the lens to shoot. Mm -hmm. So I was just really happy to, um, one, just have like so much like collaboration from from other people to yeah. to make the images and the story we did and then um i feel like to this day is still like it's probably the most like reference project <laughs> i get whenever i get um whenever i get something like i i really want to do oh, that's um, awesome yeah they'll be like yeah do do that again yeah um, that's awesome we'll definitely we'll have to link it um in the show notes so that people can can take a look at that because it's it's beautiful it is it's definitely a beautiful beautiful project so and then i have one i have one last thing to say sure, about sure. it too um that was actually a project that like Addie Lena, she paid like out of pocket herself to like do um wow so like it was almost like like passion project but um i think that just reinforced that like man um and you don't really need it, it is nice when you have like a, a big budget um and obviously like things should be you know for like client work and stuff should be budgeted but um, I don't feel, I feel like it's always necessary. I feel like when people are like passionate about the ideas and the concepts um, and people can like buy into the central vision, um, yeah, you can make things that you're, you're really proud of. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's excellent. That is excellent. So, so I wanted to ask you too about just the, the patience that goes into making a project like that and all the attention to detail and then also the things that could possibly go wrong right because i mean it seems like whenever there's creativity involved and whenever there's technology involved there's just so many different things that can happen that you don't predict or you don't expect so would you would you describe yourself as a patient person or kind of what helps you to you know juggle all of those pieces that's a great question um i think i've grown to become a patient person i think like as i've gotten older i'm like realizing that like most people when they they do things that may you know affect you in like a negative way it's not always like with malicious intent it might just be like, oh, this is just the first time that I'm possibly working with this person and we don't necessarily know each other's rhythms or um, we're not aware of like assumptions. Like, oh, I know that, you know, this director likes, um, you know, their, their lighting to be like really like soft and, and, and natural, um, you know, or I might be working with like, you know, crew who, who, you know, I haven't worked with before. And it's just like, you know, I can't really assume, you know, certain things that I might assume with the people that I work with on the day to day. So like at first, I think um, it's definitely like some frustration because um, you're constantly like collaborating with like new people and, you know, you know, it's, it's, Oh, I guess, yeah, over time, I think, like, I'm just growing to learn that, you know, I can't, I can't, I can't just be, like, impatient with people. I have to kind of, like, take the time to get to know people, to communicate, um, to kind of, like, have them communicate to me so I can also understand, like, what their needs are. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, and I think, like, every project kind of demands, like, like patience and flexibility from everyone involved. Like there's, you know, even like outside of like what I do, like there's so many variables um, that could affect the success of, the, of a project um, from, could be something that's just like getting a location and then the location not being available, um, you know, like right before the shoot um, or just having to send out like logistics, but like the logistics changing, you know, up to like you know the shot clock of the shoot the night before right. um so yeah like i i don't know i just try to like put myself in like other people's shoes um you know there's usually like <clears throat> usually a reason for like you know chaos when it occurs and you know for the most part people like you know if something is like staring left you know they'll try to like 
at least the people that I work with, I, I feel like I've had like, I'm lucky to have had like a lot of like solid and good work experiences. A lot of people will really just try to like correct whenever things are, you know, off course, or they'll try to like ask questions to figure out like, yo, what is, what is, what is like at the root of, um, you know, the, the, the static that we're having. But yeah, I think I've, I'm, I would, yeah, I'm, I'm super patient. Um, I, don't, I don't like stress. <laughs> so, so that that is awesome that you know you've just built that that patience over time and that flexibility to you know to be able to adapt and move with you know with everything that's going on. So, what has been kind of the the craziest um, experience or or something like unexpected that you had to to work through, and how did you how did you deal with that? <laughs> and. Um... It's been a few, <laughs> <laughs> but I think one of the most, the more recent ones that I've had um, was basically this was a project where um, just due to the, the talent, um, there was like secret service involved. Um, oh, wow. And that was the first time that I'd ever um, been the director of photography on a project where um, like logistics needed to be like so tight that like basically any any anything we needed to do needed to be communicated to the secret service for like safety reasons um to the the talents like you know communication and, and pr team yeah and like once it was locked in um couldn't make any changes so you know we're throughout the the prep period for the project we're sending like floor plans um we're sending um you know little basically every single like detail you could imagine just to make sure that we're, we're in a position to you know be successful on the day of not have any um you know any deviations like from that plan um so up to that point i'm feeling fine i'm feeling good you know we, we took the time to like the whole team took the time to like talk through everything and feel confident in our approach um, but on the day of, like the pace was like un unreal. Like it was oh, unlike wow. anything that I've ever experienced. And I almost I feel like bulletproof. Like if if nothing else is like that pace, I feel like I can like handle it. Um, but it was just one of these things where um, one thing that wasn't communicated to us was like how much time we would have to move from like one like setup to the next. Um, so and basically it was no time. So like. Once we finish the scene with the talent, um, you kept, you hold what you have, you get in the vehicle, you go to the next one. Like, there's no time to like run back and like grab anything. There's no time to, um, you know, do the things that you would typically do. Like, yeah, you know, grab grab gear, make sure that like you're in good position as far as like media, like power for your 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 camera and your other gear. Um, um, and in general, it was just like such a crazy rush, um, but like one where I feel like it like made me a better, um, I feel like I like leveled up really quickly from that project. And I took a lot of like useful like notes um, where, you know, if I was ever to like do it again or anything like similar, um, like I feel like I know what questions to ask. I feel like I know, um, you know, what things like staffing wise could be done to like make the at least like the camera department's experience a little bit more seamless yeah um it was crazy like at the end of the day i i was like so tired i had to like ask one of the other operators to like take my camera from me um i just had to like go to the bathroom and just like have <laughs> like a wow. second um wow. i think I, I think i had like uh i think i just need like water or something but um yeah overall it was a it was a really like great experience. Thank you for for sharing that that experience because like I said I can only imagine all of the the logistics that go into making film projects. And actually on that topic, I know this is something that I I was really eager to ask you about because this is a breaking news story that is happening even as we are in the midst of this recording, uh, we are now recording today. It's the beginning of October. And um, as of this recording, there are actually talks of 
um, specific filmmakers and people who are in the creative industry actually going on strike because of these like super challenging and what's this is really beyond challenging conditions we're actually talking about uh, inhumane conditions that a lot of these filmmakers are are experiencing so Aaron can you talk a little bit about that at least as, as much as you know and just kind of give your thoughts on just how these filmmakers have been have been treated um yeah for sure um so i guess just for for context um uh the main like union that like all of the uh like anyone who like works in film um works under is called iotsi um it's the i always forget what the abbreviation i think it's like yes, the i think it's International Association of Theatrical, I wrote down, International yeah. Association of Theatrical Stage Employees. Yeah, there you go. Yes. Um, it's basically, um, um, you know, they've got bargaining contracts and um, with with COVID, um, you know, there was, you know, kind of basically some like restructuring done just because of like streaming um, and, um, there was like this period in between when that restructuring happened to see like, you know, how successful, um, you know, streaming projects would be. Um, and basically like the contract came to an end, um, but like nothing changed as far as like, you know, compensation, like benefits, um, working conditions for people under, under IOTC, mm -hmm. um, despite like, you know, the streaming platforms doing as well if not like better than like what was anticipated um and um that obviously that's not gonna like bode well with like like anyone um especially if you're working under conditions that are um they can be like pretty rough at times um yeah i was reading in the article they said that they wouldn't give them sufficient breaks like not sufficient meal breaks they couldn't you know, rest on and even even in between jobs, there might not even be enough period between to to actually, you know, recover and be ready for the next one. Yeah, yeah. No, um, like, I feel like I'm fortunate, because, again, like a lot of my work experiences have been under people who, um, thankfully, like have the, the crew's best interests at hand. Um, I've only had like a, a handful that um, you know, weren't things, weren't situations that I would like want to be in again, but, um, yeah, basically, um, the, the union authorized, a, a strike vote, um, and it's mainly like television shows and like, mm -hmm. you know, big budget, like feature films that would largely be in, impacted by these things, commercials possibly as well. Um, don't quote me on that. Um, but um, I think it's just good that, you know, one that like voices are being heard. Yeah. Um, that there's like a step in the right direction to like make sure that, you know, people can work in like a civilized way and like, you know, not feel the pressure to like not do the thing that they enjoy um, to like leave their job just because it's like too much like stress. Right. Um, uh, and like unnecessary stress on them. Um, yeah, and I, I know you were saying that a lot of the um, the union jobs, like a, or a lot of the big jobs require you to be in that in that union. Is that is that correct? Yeah, they'll typically hire from like a union roster um, um, for like when like a movie comes to town or something, um, it'll be and like they're looking for like camera department people they'll pull people who are all like registered union members from it and then um there's also like a mix of like non-union jobs um a, a good amount as well but typically for like like I, I don't know like what the like budget number is but for most of the stuff that we see on like streaming platforms um in theaters um those are typically typically union jobs and you'll see like yeah. at the end of the credits they'll have like the IOC logo and this is like an IOT production. Sort oh, of thing. see, now I have to look for that. I've never noticed that before. I have to pay attention to that. Yeah. 
Yeah, that that's um, amazing. So this is happening in real time. So by the time that this airs, that this episode airs, there will have been a decision about whether or not these employees are going to to strike. And if they do, I mean, it can really impact not just Hollywood, but across the country, just all of the the uh, the union workers who are demanding these um, these conditions. And I mean, personally, I have just really I was just really in shock of the fact that, you know, they they were getting so much pushback for things that to me seem like they're very logical asks. It really shocked me to know the type of conditions that that so many individuals were were experiencing. But what is your prediction about what what might happen? That's tough, man. I I feel like I I hope and feel like there will be like renegotiation, um, especially for like I say for like the most like vulnerable people. Um, like I know like production assistants, like they're typically like the youngest people who like they're not really getting paid much. Yeah. Um, and are working like kind of like like round the clock um, to you know just to to it could be doing things like making runs they're the ones like picking up like you know food for the crew um pretty much doing like whatever is is asked of them um and again the compensation is, is typically like pretty low um i'm hopeful that there will be you know some type of like increased wages yeah um for them um hopefully increased wages for everyone um especially given that like everyone's working during covid um like it's technically like like there's still we're still in a pandemic <laughs> um so uh, like hopefully like that's um like addressed and not just yeah. something that's kind of like glazed over this is weird uh, yeah like you said like that that this is even like a a discussion like basic yeah like and i don't know, you know what the motivation yeah. is you know besides you know financial i mean i assume that everything crazy stems from a financial reason but, you know besides that it's like what is the motivation to continue to treat these people under you know and have them work under such harmful conditions and unsafe conditions so and you know besides money i can't even think of the reason or the justification uh for that so i i do hope that it that it changes as well and uh, i pretty sure that the answer is always money right <laughs> um, right <laughs> but yes, yeah nah, yes. I, yeah that's yeah 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 well this has been a great conversation Aaron I really appreciate again um having you on the show and this is your first uh podcast correct it's my first podcast yeah I'm honored to to say that I was on Samantha McCoy's podcast thank you yes. so much for, for having me Awesome. No problem. No problem. So before we let you go, what is advice, a piece of advice that you would give someone who is looking to um, enter into cinematography or, or filmmaking? Yeah. So even like whatever you're like trying to do, um, I would say try to like make your own work. Um, I feel like that's the best way to communicate to people what you want to do um, to like develop your voice and figure out um, just figure out like what you're you're trying to like say with the medium um, and I also feel like it's the best way to just like practice um, it's I think film is kind of a weird medium where like you need like a lot of different hands to um, realize the vision of a, of a project but um at the same time i feel like you know by like making things and like you know, maybe like calling on your like friends to whether it's to like act or to like help you like set up a scene um i think like looking back on my career i feel like you know whether it was like me initiating a project or like a director friend of mine um doing a passion project of theirs i feel like we've reaped the most benefit from those projects because they're projects that touch upon like, you know, like what's inside of us, things we want to say, um, how we like to, um, and like how we like to say them. Um, so like, and then obviously like still like 
you know, crew on people's projects and, you know, build connections, um, definitely build community um, because we're all freelancers, you know, for the most part at the end of the day and our, our network is the people that we work with on set and they're, you know, typically the people who are gonna hire you for the next job. Um, so I would say, yeah, like, yeah, make your own projects, yeah. you know, share your voice. Um, and like, as you're you know, continuing to work and, and build just um, really just value like community um, and feed into people the same way that they're feeding into you um, to like help grow your career. Um, then then they were all like peers and, you know, trying to do the same thing. Um, and it's a lot easier to, to get there like together. Yes. Well, that is great advice to, to close out on. So you said, make your own, share your voice, build your network and value others. That is, those are some great tips. So thank you so, so much, Aaron, for joining. Again, we will link your uh, website in the show notes so that people can see what you are doing and the amazing work that you've done so far. And where can people follow you to learn more? Yeah. Um, I'm mostly on Instagram. Um, my handle is it's just my government, Aaron M, as in Michael Tucker. And I usually just share like, you know, recent work, um, what I might be watching. Um, I usually just use it as like that slash like comedic relief to, you know, just stay sane. That's awesome. 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 Well, thank you, Aaron, for joining. And we are so excited about what is next for you. And we will be following you on all of your platforms. All right. Thank you so much, Samantha. This is so much fun. Um, man, surreal. Thank you. Well, thank you all so much for joining and we will see you back on the next episode. Again, I am your host, Samantha McCoy. I am the founder and CEO of Mission Key Communications, and we are a public relations firm that equips entrepreneurs and leaders to increase their visibility through public relations and personal branding strategies. And you can follow me on Instagram at smccoy joy. So we'll see you back for the next episode. Take care, everyone. Peace.